When Job's three friends, Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuite, and Zophar the Naamathite, heard about all the troubles that had come upon him, they set out from their homes and met together by agreement to go and sympathize with him and comfort him. When they saw him from a distance, they could hardly recognize him. They began to weep aloud, and they tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads. Then they sat on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights. No one said a word to him, because they saw how great his suffering was. After this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. He said, May the day of my birth perish, and the night that said, A boy is conceived, that day may it turn to darkness. May God above not care about it. May no light shine on it. May gloom and utter darkness claim it once more. May a cloud settle over it. May blackness overwhelm it. That night may thick darkness seize it. May it not be included among the days of the year, nor be entered in any of the months. May that night be barren, may no shout of joy be heard in it. May those who curse days curse that day, those who are ready to rouse Leviathan. May its morning stars become dark, may it wait for daylight in vain, and not see the first rays of dawn. For it did not shut the doors of the womb on me to hide trouble from my eyes. This is the word of the Lord. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Reading from Luke chapter 22, beginning at verse 39. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, Pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed. Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. When he rose from prayer and went back to the, the, the disciples, he found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping? he asked them. Get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. This is the gospel of the Lord. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, please open our ears to hear your word, our minds that we might understand it, and our hearts that we might obey it. Amen. <coughs> Well, I'm so grateful uh, that I have friends. Uh, that might come as a surprise to some of you, that I would have any friends, but I do have, and I regard them as one of the many blessings God has given me in my life. This morning, I want to introduce you not to my friends, but to Job's friends. There are three of them, uh, Eliphaz, uh, the Tim the Temanite, uh, Bildad the Shuhite, he was very short of course, he was Shuhite, and Zophar the Namathite, they came to comfort Job in all his distress. For those of you who were here last week or who have caught up with the sermon from last week online, you'll know 
that Job had suffered, the catastrophe of losing nearly everything, his animals, his servants, and his children. The only thing really left to him was his health and his wife. But now, sadly, as we rejoin the story at the tail end of chapter 2, even his health has been taken away. Meanwhile, his wife, in the brief appearance that she makes, isn't overly helpful, as all she seems to do is to encourage her husband to abandon his principles and curse God and die. In this real time of need, you would have thought then that Job's friends would be critical to his well-being, that they would be critical to help him, in, help him, him get through what has just happened to him. Now, perhaps it's worth pausing for a moment to recognize that in our day, we often use that word friend in a somewhat loose way, don't we? Partly thanks, I think, to Facebook. But, of course, any of us who are on Facebook will know not all one's friends are necessarily friends. Indeed, certainly not good friends. Many may be passing acquaintances. Or indeed, perhaps people one only met once. Canadian leadership expert Kerry Newhoff offers these wise words. But relationally, social media creates a sense of false connection. It gives the promise of knowing people without really knowing them. It gives the appearance of connection without being deeply connected. Happily, though, in Job's day, friend meant something special. A friend was bound to you with bonds of steadfast love. The underlying Hebrew word suggesting something like pledged, unbreakable, covenant, loyal, uh, love and loyalty. It is then deeply encouraging to know that Job had three friends, men who were bound to him with ties of steadfast love and loyalty. And certainly their time with Job began well enough. We're told in chapter 2 and verse 11, they set out from their homes and met together by agreement to go and sympathize with him and comfort him. However, it's not that long before the cracks are starting to show. They are shocked by Job's appearance. Well, I do have some sympathy here. I hope it's not an inappropriate thing to say, but occasionally when visiting someone in hospital, I have been taken aback by how much they have changed since I last saw them. So some sympathy for Job's friends. They begin to weep aloud, tear their robes, and sprinkle dust on their heads. To some extent, this is normal mourning behavior. That said, it would seem to be the case that they were weeping more at him than with him. In other words, this was about their needs and not about his needs. And then they sit in silence. I am very aware that sometimes silence is exactly the right approach. I have sat with people in silence on occasions simply because there is nothing useful to say. They need my presence, but they don't need my inane advice and chatter. Uh, a while ago, I listened to a short podcast uh, in which Simon Sinek, uh, he's an author and apparently an inspirational speaker. I'd love to be one of those. Uh, Simon Sinek was see speaking to business leader Stephen Bartlett. Sinek made the observation that more often than not, when people are in crisis, they don't want solutions, but for someone, and here I quote, to let them vent and sit in the mud with them. And so silence can be exactly the right approach. But that said, would seven whole days and nights not perhaps have become a tad unnerving and unhelpful, even if perhaps they were waiting for Job to speak first. After all, it's a mighty long time to say nothing to a man who, to all intents and purposes, has lost everything. 
Christopher Ash, whose commentary on Job I have found helpful as I have got to get grips with the book of Job, uh, speaks of this extended silence as not so much a silence of sympathy, even if it had begun as such, as a silence of bankruptcy. Job, despite the presence of his three friends, is terribly alone. As I prepared for today, I was reminded of Jesus' prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. We heard about it just now in that Gospel reading. And of course, we may hear it again in the coming weeks as we head towards Easter. Jesus wasn't alone. He had his disciples, disciples who were close by as he prayed to God concerning his approaching cross. And yet there is a sense in which Jesus was terribly alone, an aloneness underlined by the fact that as he prayed, his disciples slept and he found them asleep when he returned to them were thanks for nothing. At the beginning of Job 3, the focus shifts as we come to Job's first words, since losing everything and his friends arriving. Chapter 3, verse 1, after this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. Here we truly hear the cry of Job's heart and soul, as he says in effect, he really wishes that he had not been born. Satan had, of course, said to God that if Job lost everything, he would curse God's name. But Job doesn't do that. Feasibly, he comes close, but he doesn't curse God's name. Rather, he curses the day of his birth. Of course, life is a gift from God, and in that sense, Job should have been grateful for it. But when things have hit rock bottom, you can really understand why Job speaks as he does. As for what Job then goes on to say in the verses that follow, this is an, uh, an elaboration of his opening de declaration that it would have been better had he not been born. We might notice, for instance, how Job expands on the day of his birth by piling up words for darkness. Verses 4 and 5, that day, may it turn to darkness, may God above not care about it, may no light shine on it, may gloom and utter darkness claim it once more, may a cloud settle over it, may blackness overwhelm it. The darkness of verse 5 is not so much the darkness of a naturally cloudy day as the thick, deep darkness, such as one would encounter down a mine shaft. Real, overwhelming blackness. Life is so painful for Job that he wishes that the roots of his existence might be recaptured by death and darkness. As Christopher Ash says, he wishes God would rewind the tape of creation and undo the part that led to his existence. Such a wish is empty, of course, because it can't happen. But nevertheless, that is his wish. In our reading this morning, we stopped at verse 10 to keep things manageable. However, Job's lament does not stop there. Had we wanted to, we could have continued through the rest of the chapter where we would have seen how Job continues to rue the day of his birth, wishing instead that he would be asleep and be at rest. Being a friend and facing the storm, next week we'll return to Job's friends as we look at the first speech of Eliphaz. Meanwhile, let's consider how these two things, being a friend and facing the storm, maybe speak into our own situation. First, being a friend. <clears throat> All of us here today have a ministry of standing alongside those who are suffering, just as Job's friends did. Even if, as we have begun to see and will continue to see, they didn't do a particularly good job. 
Paul, in a famous verse in Romans chapter 12, appeals to Christian believers to weep with those who weep. Of course, he also appeals to them to rejoice with those who rejoice. But at the moment, we are thinking about weeping. At this church, we are blessed with a pastoral team. Very grateful for them. However, it isn't down to just them to weep with those who weep. In various ways, we are all called to a weeping with others ministry to be alongside another person when they are going through a difficult time. It seems to me that one essential aspect of this weeping with others ministry is to assure those who are going through difficult times that despite what they may be feeling, God is with them and still loves them. I've mentioned this before, I think, but when going through a prolonged and testing period of my own some years ago, I was grateful to two friends who, knowing how tough things were for me, gave me a bookmark. That's all they did. They gave me a bookmark. But it made all the difference. On that bookmark were some very uplifting words, which included these famous words from Teresa of Avila. Trust in God. Let nothing disturb you. Let nothing frighten you. All things pass. God never changes. Patience achieves all it strives for. He who has God finds he lacks nothing. God alone suffices. As I read and reread those words over the next few days, God ministered to me. And I had a very real sense of the darkness beginning to lift, being a friend. As for facing the storm, although an obvious thing to say, but I'll say it anyway, this is something that comes to us all, whether Christian or non-Christian, and sometimes many times over. Christopher Ashe is right then to call out what he calls the easy triumphalism around today in certain Christian circles. The triumphalism which seems to imply that Christians are somehow immune from life's harsher realities. Many of us will know the well-known song, Jesus, we celebrate your victory. Here's uh, some words from that. His spirit in us releases us from fear. The way to him is open. With boldness we draw near. And in his presence our problems disappear. Our hearts responding to his love. Nice sentiment, of course, but completely unrealistic. When going through the tough times, God's presence with us can make a ton of difference. At least I hope so, but our problems disappearing. No, I'm not sure they do. Which all suggests, I think, that the sooner we, like Job, learn the language of lament, the better. Job, as we have seen, doesn't hold back. He tells it as it is, expressing his anger, his regret, his despair. We, on the other hand, sometimes find it hard to be this honest, this honest to God and this honest to one another. After all, we are British. Well, I think most of us are. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not suggesting that we blast every last person within range with our baggage. And yet there is a case, I think, for learning the language of lament and particularly when speaking to God, using words that express exactly what we are feeling. Over the years, I have found it very healing to be able to do just that, to tell God where I am really struggling, in what ways I am really fed up, what I want him to do about my situation. Of course, if you are going to do that on Bookham Common as you go for a walk, as I sometimes do, then I do suggest you might want to look around just to check no one's nearby. But nevertheless, lamenting can be good for the soul. Being a friend and facing the storm, may the Lord grant us grace to do both of these things well. Amen.
Gracious God, we have come together today to thank and praise you for your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. And during this time of Lent, when we consider his suffering that led to the cross, we pray for your Holy Spirit to be with each of us, particularly as we study the book of Job. Lord, we pray for our church leader, Justin of Canterbury, our ministerial team here, Alan, Jill, David, Barbara, Celeste, and all those that undertake your ministry here in Booking. May their discipleship encourage us all. We pray for our sovereign King Charles. May he know your love and be inspired to have the courage and strength of Job in the face of his cancer. We pray for his family and especially for the recovery of the Princess of Wales. Lord, may you encourage our King and his family to be exemplary examples of Christian faith, reaching out to all the people of the UK and Commonwealth. Merciful Father, as we approach the need for a general election, may we pray for the safety of our parliamentarians and councillors. May they know the love of Christ and act with honesty, wisdom, dignity and consideration as they seek to govern. We pray for all those that have been wronged by the post office. May those in a position of authority to right these ills act with speed and compassion. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for your wonderful world and we pray for peace in your world. We pray especially for the peoples of Ukraine, Israel and Gaza. May peace come upon them. For those in this country who carry knives as weapons, may they lay down their weapons and be inspired by you to live in service and peace. Lord, we are heartened by the actions and faith of Job and pray for those of our parish who are sick and awaiting procedures, scans and consultations. We especially remember Tim Reader, Jenny Carlier, Sylvia Charles, Billy Thompson, Peter Scotchfield, and Elizabeth Finucane. We pray also for others known to us in our hearts. May they find your love and comfort in the anxiety and pain of illness. We pray you may ease the pain of grief for the families and friends of those who have recently died and thinking of Colin Finucane and his family. Eternal rest grant to them, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon them. May they rest in peace, and Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, as we reflect on Lent in our lives, we pray for your Holy Spirit to encourage our Christian life together, together in church, in our house and prayer groups. Open our hearts and minds to the message of Job. Let us not be diverted by the distractions of the modern world, and may our house and prayer groups welcome new members. Lord, we give you thanks for all who support the parish, both financially and for those that work together in the various teams that keep our church working in a spirit of unity and purpose. We ask that you guide our various teams in the presence and power of Jesus, remembering especially Margaret Hibbard and that of the fair trade and eco. We thank you also for our fabric team that maintain the very fabric of this church that all can see is raised to your glory. Lord, we are conscious that many in the UK 
feel the anguish of Job, particularly about their future. And for those in financial need, may they be brave enough to seek Cap's compassionate advice. We thank you for the success of Cap's fundraising quiz yesterday evening. It was a success. Gracious God, we look for your spirit to guide Celeste and her team as they seek to grow the families and children's ministry of our church. We give thanks and praise and prayer for Tots Alive. May we find sufficient helpers and may it continue to grow. I believe we are wel welcoming the christening of Sebastian Lee to the family of God later this morning. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, you alone know our hearts and prayers, and we pray for those who come to you from this parish, remembering those, particularly on our electoral roll, and our neighbours, both as individuals and families who live in the Garstons. Lord, may we welcome all, thanking you for the encouragement provided by Alan and Jill today. Lord, we rejoice in you and pray that you fill us with your love, peace, compassion and wisdom. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>